We end up evaluating about 200 different ideas every year. And that's nonprofits, it's for profits, it's big companies, it's small companies, it's government agencies. It's really anyone who we think, right, has a novel or scalable solution to housing affordability. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can hear all the buzz around multifamily housing with all the info you need to help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Hi, I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Gary Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Let's get started. Since Garrick and I started the Buzz House podcast around April of 2020, one of our goals was to bring you what's new, creative, and innovative in the multifamily space with a lot of emphasis, of course, on affordable housing. We talk about a range of topics, including financing structures and tools, construction methods, along with policy updates. I was more than thrilled when I learned about what today's guest and organization is focused on. Today's guest on the Buzz House is Jenna Louie, the Chief Innovation and Strategy Officer of Ivory Innovations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing innovative solutions in housing affordability. It is housed within the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah and was founded in 2017. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Garrett to jump into our conversation with Jenna. We're very excited for this. Thanks again, Jenna, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Don, for that introduction. And Jenna, welcome to the show. We're very excited to have you on. Before we begin with our questions where you're going to give us all this great information, would you please tell our listeners a little bit more about Ivory Innovations, what was the inspiration for the creation of the organization, overall mission, and your role within the organization? Happily. Thanks so much, Garrick. So Ivory Innovations, as Don had said, is a nonprofit, right? Our mission is to catalyze innovation in housing affordability. And one of the things I really want to emphasize right at the start is many of your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with, right, is we don't use the words affordable housing. We use the term of housing affordability, rather, because we're looking at a whole bunch of different innovations and solutions across the spectrum, not necessarily just those that are income restricted. That being said, I think our work is incredible. Of course, I'm biased. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. We have a couple of different focus areas, but really the key idea that underpins everything we do is that there's a lot of focus in this industry on the issues of housing affordability, right? And and that's important. It's important to do that research. It's important to make sure that we understand why things are happening and and where things are going wrong. But back in 2017, the CEO of Ivory Homes, so it's uh, Utah's largest home builder, privately held company was looking across the country and said, we do what we can to build in Utah. We do what we can to make housing more affordable here. But gosh, there's real need here across the country. And how can we start to address that? And so his family foundation actually seeded Ivory Innovations up at the University of Utah with the idea of, could we take a small organization, a couple of people and start looking across the country? What was innovative? What's happening out there? And so across three different focus areas, construction and design, finance and policy and regulatory reform, we started to identify different innovators and different solutions that we thought had novel and scalable approaches to what was happening in housing, right? And so this is new methods of construction. It's new ways of financing. It's thinking about community ownership. It's thinking about innovative policy approaches that maybe others hadn't tried. And how could we take those ideas and have a little bit of a microphone, a little bit of a megaphone and try to champion them? And since 2017, we've really grown. And so we started with just that idea really centered on the Ivory Prize for housing affordability, looking for solutions. And we've grown since into everything from working with students really deeply to hosting conferences to even building capital A affordable units uh, back in Utah. So that's a little bit about the organization. My role as Chief Innovation and Strategy Officer is to think about how can we go out and create a partner ecosystem for the organizations and for the solutions that we find in order to help them grow and scale even further. Thanks for that intro, Jenna. And I like the way you mentioned that distinction, the innovative solutions in housing affordability versus affordable housing. That's interesting. And digging into your organization a little more, we read that you have four main focus areas. Will you start out by letting us know more about your first two focus areas, convening and learning from the industry's foremost experts and source and support for the best entrepreneurial solutions? 
Yeah. And so those two focus areas, convening experts and then sourcing and supporting entrepreneurial solutions. So I just mentioned the Ivory Prize for Housing Affordability. That's really how we gather the best ideas. And so every year we have a team of students that goes out and looks for these ideas. We also love to hear from referrals. So anyone in the audience today, any of your listeners that think, wow, you know, I just met someone amazing. I think they might be a fit. We would love to hear from you. And so collectively, we end up evaluating about 200 different ideas every year. And that's nonprofits, it's for-profits, it's big companies, it's small companies, it's government agencies. It's really anyone who we think right has a novel or scalable solution to housing affordability. And so taking all of those ideas, we end up vetting them with a panel of judges. And so you can think of these people as some of the people that you work with on a daily basis, the Joint Center for Housing Studies up at Harvard, the Urban Institute, and some of the people from Freddie Mac are really trying to bring together experts in the field who can say, we've seen this before, we haven't seen this before, and here are some of the pitfalls as we evaluate this idea. And so from that effort, we end up picking 25 different ideas each year of that uh, roughly 200 or so. And then we ultimately end up awarding three winners. But really, it's that top 25 set of ideas and solutions that we like to champion. Over the last five years since we've been running the prize, we have over 120 organizations in that portfolio. So that's the second focus area. The first focus area is how do we bring those organizations together? How do we bring those ideas together with experts, with people who are focused on the issues and say, well, you identified a great issue. And hey, here's a solution. And even better, hey, here's a partner ecosystem. Here are some funders that can really help juice this thing, right? Like, let's go big. Let's grow sustainably. Let's think about how to bring this idea to more places in the country. And so how do we find ways to put all of that together? Um, and, And that's kind of where our focus areas have evolved in order to think of this customer journey from we've identified issues, we found solutions, how can we help them grow? Very good. Thank you very much for that, Jenna. And I know this probably kind of all ties together and you may have touched on this a little bit, but just staying one more question here on your focus area is about seeking ideas from the next generation. And maybe that's kind of tied into these innovation awards and so forth and and kind of putting that innovation into practice. Maybe just maybe take that a little bit further if you if you would. Happily. Yeah. And so I'd mentioned our student associates. They are one of my favorite parts of our program. And so Don, Garrick, right? We're talking here about housing affordability. I'm sure that, and you've talked about affordable housing, right? All of it. And many in the audience too, right? This is a passion area. But one of the things that I think is really important and really different about our program is that we work with students, not only because, hey, it's great to bring new people into the industry. It's great to work with young folks. Most of our interns are from the University of Utah. They're undergrads, they're graduate students. That's wonderful. But Really, when we think about the people who are facing the hardest and the most challenging housing issues, it is young people today, right? You know, we're sitting here, we're recording this podcast. This is amazing, but we're probably stably housed, right? And many of the people in the audience are probably stably housed, but some of our interns, um, that keeps it real. One of our interns in Utah, right? He's supporting his family. He, he has a lot of different things going on and he also drives for Uber even as he's interning with us. One that a little bit breaks my heart, like, shoot, I wish we could give you more hours. We, there's only so much work that our interns end up doing for us. But two, to make his ends meet, he he's a rideshare driver. And that's the kind of thing where I say, this is why we do this work. This is why we need to find scalable solutions, even in a market like Salt Lake City, which has not for the longest time been one of the most expensive, but it is growing and rent is really outpacing income. This is why we do this work. And so that kind of grounding and keeping us focused on what is most important and who are we designing for as we talk about these solutions. That's one of the real reasons that we engage the next generation. We also do things, again, really focused on solutions like Hack a House. And so this is a funky challenge. It's a 24-hour hackathon we hold every fall. And we invite students from across the country and honestly, across the world, we've had a couple of Germans and a couple of Australians participate. And we say, how could you take prompt? So how do you make housing more affordable? How do you think about lowering costs? Um, So something really broad, come up with a novel idea and pitch it to us, pitch it to our judges and hey, you could win some money. And so we have hundreds of students participate every year. It's so much fun. And we've had everything from during the pandemic, there were a lot of cruise ships that were sitting empty, as we can imagine. And one of the student teams said, we know this is not a long-term solution, but for temporary housing, as we think about the pandemic, what if we could requisition those cruise ships and turn them into kind of floating temporary housing? right? We've run out of space in the Bay Area where this team was based. Can we put people into the water essentially, right? Can we use these cruise ships to create new housing? When you look at that from the outside, you think, 
that's wacky. There's not an idea possibly that would have come to mind for maybe someone in the industry. But one of the students was a former naval officer. And, and she said, I've been on ships. I've been on ships for the last 10 years before going to business school. So I know what I'm talking about. And so it's ideas like that where it's like, oh man, that might not turn into a real startup. That might, I don't know, we're not going to call the city of San Francisco and say, hey, you need to requisition a cruise ship. But we would say, wow, thank you so much for participating with us over the last 24 hours. Thank you for bringing your creativity to this industry. And we hope that through this process, you have challenged your thinking, right? You've challenged your thinking about housing. You've thought in novel and creative ways. And and will you take that with you as you continue on in your career? And so that's really the focus on students. Man, you hear, (laughs) hopefully you hear some of my excitement. The fourth focus area of putting it into practice, that's where we're building capital A affordable units in Utah and also trying to bring some of those solutions and innovators to our state when possible. And so that just got started about a year ago. And we are building about 800 units over the next couple of years of income-restricted housing and trying to find ways where possible, especially on the construction side, can we de-risk some of those ideas and put them into practice because of our philanthropic backing. Wow. No, that's just amazing. And I hope our listeners enjoy it. And I, I really hope we stay in touch, Jen, honestly, after this, because we're always looking for innovation. That's what you're focusing on. This would be great. And Jenna, maybe, you know, now kind of jumping into, I think this will be a lot of fun, right? You kind of talked about the top 25 and obviously there's kind of quote unquote winners or, or get the innovation awards, maybe touching on you know, the three different areas. And I know when you and I talked a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the policy and regulatory reform category. You mentioned the National Zoning Atlas. Would you let our listeners know a little bit more about this project and, and where it stands today? Absolutely. And this is one of my favorite things as we are talking about Buzz House. So many of the other episodes that you have hosted, so many of the other guests really tie into what we focus on in Ivory Innovations, right? I, you've recently talked about church and land reforms, right? That's, that's a policy area that we're really curious about. You've talked about financing and permitting efficiencies. That's what we look at. You talked about new construction methods. Well, what does that look like for lenders, right? That's really hard. We talk about de-risking. And so just at the high level, I, I wanted to say thank you for having me on. Thinking about the National Zoning Atlas, uh, this is an amazing effort. And I really hope everyone should go to zoningatlas.org in order to learn more. And so really, this effort got started a couple of years ago in Connecticut. So back in 2020, there's a lot of focus on land use. There's a lot of focus on racial equity and racial bias and, and how that's perpetuated in land use, rather, in land regulations. And so an effort called Desegregate Connecticut was spun up by a couple of different folks. And it was really the effort of how could we look at land use as the status quo segregation, racial segregation, when we look at the history of Connecticut, how land is used, how single family zoning is really, I think it was 97% of the state zoning at that time. And what does that mean, right, for equitable outcomes? It, It doesn't generally mean great things. And so they ended up putting together a database of the state's land use codes, um, all of the zoning codes, and they presented it to the legislators and they said, hey, there's no bias here. This is just the facts, right? And this is something that we all know anecdotally. We all know where single family neighborhoods are. We all know where the multifamily neighborhoods are. We might know where the planning commission or the planning council is thinking, okay, we're going to put something a little bit taller here. Maybe if you're really lucky, missing middle. But very infrequently, do you have that data at your fingertips in a visual form? And that is the power of the zoning atlas at a national scale. And so they're taking what they did in Connecticut and really expanding it out. And so this is a volunteer-led effort. I really want to emphasize this. They can use all of the support they can get. And it's really been incredible to see the zoning atlas was completed in Connecticut, really for racial and desegregation issues, right? That was the grounding thought. And they ended up pushing through some really incredible land reforms at the state level coming out of that. The next zoning atlas to be completed was actually in Montana. Completely different political alignment behind that effort. That was really about freedom of land use. I'm an owner with a ranch. Who are you to tell me what I am doing with my property? Right. And so property rights was really the galvanizing effort and some of the organizations behind it in Montana. But you end up having the same result, which is you've got a visual representation of what is taking place in your neighborhood, in your city, across the state. And officials can start to say, huh, this is what I maybe knew anecdotally, but it is really harsh to have it right in front of me visually. And so Montana actually recently passed a series of land reforms focused on 
You could call it upzoning, you could call it deregulation, whatever you might say, but really things that are going to enable more housing production. I think the state of Rhode Island is well on their way to completing it. The zoning atlas effort is live in at least 30 different states now. Again, all of volunteer-led efforts. So we are starting a zoning atlas in Utah to try to get that same work completed. I am so excited about their work. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Again, very exciting as it kind of moves around the country. Jenna, looking at the list of Ivory Prize winners in the construction and design industry category, we see a number of innovations around offsite construction at scale. Would you be able to let us know about one of these organizations and innovation? Yeah, happily. And I bet that offsite construction methods are not new to anyone on BuzzHouse, right? And one of the things that we really appreciate about offsite construction, right, is the potential to lower costs. We think about speed, we think about efficiency, we think about labor. And so one of the groups that I'll mention of the many that have come through, there's been volumetric building companies is probably the biggest, but factory OS, full stack modular, you know, really across the country. Indie Dwell out of Colorado, you know, a number of others that we've talked to. But uh, volumetric building companies or VBC is probably one of the most most unique. And so I'll I'll say a few words about them. They got started in Philadelphia back right after the great financial crisis, if I remember right, and have since expanded um, into really a vertically integrated organization. And so they've got an architecture arm Right, that is de- designing the units, designing the floor plans, making sure that they're fit for modular, which is really important. As I'm sure we all know, you, you got to start early when you think of offsite construction and volumetric modular. If you were trying to shoehorn this in late, it, it's generally not a good fit. So they start early, they have that in house. They have a manufacturing arm, which is, has facilities in Philadelphia, um, outside of Philadelphia, and then also a big facility in Tracy, California. It's actually the old Katera factory. And I imagine some of us are probably familiar with Katera and the implosion of that business over time because of cash flow. And so they bought the old Katera factory, have started pumping out units on the West Coast as well. And then they've also got an installation arm. And so when we think about the potential of offsite construction, again, how do you de-risk that for lenders who are saying, hey, I, I want to build more efficiently. I want to build more affordably. Or, These are all words that I love, but this is different. This is new. The cost curves are completely odd. We have found that volumetric building companies is a really interesting answer to that, where it's if you can bring more of it into one entity, you are de-risking, you are demystifying, you are uncomplicating, if that's the word, some of that process and the handoff between different organizations as you're going through. And so Volumetric Building Companies was our winner back in 2022, if I have the year right, in the construction design category. And and we're really excited to see them grow. That's awesome. Uh, I'd like to also ask you about the last category of Innovation Awards, which is an area where, you know, I seem to find myself buried in a lot is, is finance, right? So would you be able to give an example of an innovation that actually jumps out to you? Absolutely. Yeah, finance is actually my passion area. Don't tell the other categories that I said so. It's like the favorite of three children. But this is how I originally got interested in our work was through the finance category and how can we think about new models. And so one that I think your audience might be really interested in is a group called Builders Patch. And so they were one of our finalists a few years ago. And this is builderspatch.com, if I'm not mistaken. They are focused on essentially a common app for LIHTC and afford, capital A affordable deals. And so one of the things that Canon Ajmera, who is the CEO there, she used to be a nonprofit developer herself. And she said, you spend so much time underwriting, you spend so much time changing your pro forma, sending it to a different lender, you know, shopping out your deals. And man, this is hard, right? We know that capital stacks are really complicated when it comes to affordable deals. Is there a way that software could help us? And so that's what Builders Batch is doing. They're trying to build some of the plumbing, some of the infrastructure in the back end to say, how can we eliminate some of the repetitive nature of revisioning these performers, you know, sending it out to a different lender, you know, changing it for the slightly different way that you're using this metric or that metric? And can we put all of that into a software platform that just spits it out? Right. And so for developers, you're thinking, well, guys, I can see why that's a good thing, right? I'm saving time. I, I put my information in and it's getting sent out in the right ways to the right people in the format that they like. But for lenders, what I hadn't realized when, you know, when first talking to them is that this is also really good because you can start comparing across your deals very quickly and you can actually start sourcing deals that you might not have heard about through the platform, right? And so it's, you know, oh, XYZ nonprofit developer hadn't reached out to us, but man, their metrics look good on the back end. And so Builders Patch might be able to refer a couple of deals that you you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so it's just this win-win, right? And, and you would hope that 
through a platform like that, through the thoughtful application of software, you might be able to cut costs, you might be able to cut time, you might be able to save your people time and effort, right? They can get back to doing the work they love on the ground and spending less time in Excel. And so software is not going to save the world. Sometimes I worry with, <laughs> with everything happening today, you know, so we're going to be the end of the world. But when we think about the smart application of some tools that exist, right? This is one where I'm really thrilled. The other group, if I might mention a second one without cheating here, uh, because, because this is my favorite category, there's another group called Trust Neighborhoods that's based out of Kansas City, which is a really interesting community ownership model. It's kind of an updated community land trust, and they work a lot with multifamily owners. I thought this would be another one that your audience might really enjoy. And so they're thinking about how can you take the traditional community land trust model, you know, typically based on philanthropy, typically based on grants, wonderful efforts, but hard to raise money for, very expensive. And they found a way to layer in private capital that's seeking not crazy returns, but a little bit of a concessionary return. And how could you layer them into a community land trust model and do take in and take out financing that really makes sense and also um, subsidize some of these land trust models and land trust units with market rate units that are going to float and help to keep everything else affordable in perpetuity. And so they call their model a mixed income neighborhood trust. And again, just two really interesting things where you think about Wait, how are we bringing new capital into what has traditionally been a very hard area to raise it, right? It's just really expensive to acquire and preserve. And then how can you help people in, in some of these neighborhoods that are facing displacement, right? How can you make sure that as many of those units as possible are preserved while also potentially allowing com- a couple of the units to, to enter the market rates phase and stay at market rate in order to ensure more affordability for the remaining folks. And so that's another one that I hope people have the ability to look at. It's trustneighborhoods.com. Perfect. No, very interesting. Jen, maybe one last question for you today. So much good information. How can our listeners learn more, stay in touch? We read and we talked at, I, I think you host an annual conference. We see many people in your uh, innovations group you know, speak at various conferences, maybe on your website. How can people kind of stay in touch and follow you and, and what's new kind of thing? Oh my gosh, please reach out. And so our website is ivoryinnovations.org. And you can see actually, if you're curious, a list of almost 500 different innovators that we've looked at over the last five years. And that's ivoryinnovations.org slash database. More generally, reach out. My email is Jenna, J E N N A, at ivoryinnovations.org. You know, we are a small but mighty team of six looking nationally for these ideas. We've got about a dozen students on the back end helping us there, but we are open source, right? We're a nonprofit focused on finding the best ideas in the space, and we know we can't do that alone. And so, if you are interested in any of the things I've mentioned today, if there's any way that we might be helpful to you, if there's anyone that you think we should meet, we would love to hear from you. And maybe, Don and Garrick, I would love to turn that question back to you is how does some of this information land? What are you thinking about? Is that you've talked to so many solutions providers, so many different people in the industry, right? What what are you seeing around housing affordability in some of our work that you know that can push us forward? Yeah, that's a great question, Jenna. And I think that's one thing we talk about too. And that's one of the reasons, honestly, for the podcast is how do we share information? There's conferences, there's just one-on-ones and things like that. But and in today's, we talked about, again, ad nauseum on our podcast, and you brought up a little bit of construction costs, interest rates, insurance. We talked a lot about insurance. So it's like, how do we tackle all these? Maybe one more question. Have you had an innovation forum or an innovation conference? Or is that something out there or a possibility that we could be part of? Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I completely forgot to mention. So thank you for reminding me. Every (laughs) year we bring together our top innovators into a forum. And so this past year, for example, we held that forum at PCBC down in Anaheim. So the Pacific Coast Builders Conference and a little bit of a West Coast focus. Next year in 2024, we are actually, so if if anyone is planning 15 months out or about 12 months out, we're holding that event, I believe on October 25th, 2024. And that is going to bring together these top innovators from our prize process to talk about what they're seeing, you know, what are their solutions, but also what are the challenges candidly that they're facing, right? It's, It's one thing to say, this is an amazing solution, right? And, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, this would be everywhere. Of course, reality is not like that. And so we try to go a little bit deeper with our solutions holders. We say, you're amazing. You're not focused on the issue. You're focused on the solution. But as you scale, as you grow, as you're continuing on, what are some of the ways that we as an ecosystem can help you? And so that might be a really interesting way for for people to stay involved. I know that that is 12 months out, but 
in the meantime, if there's any way that we can be helpful, that's why we launched this database about a year ago, is trying to make all of this knowledge that we've gathered over the last five years public, right? We don't want this to be locked up in our diligence memos right. internally. We want people to be able to find an innovator and say, oh my gosh, that would be a great fit for my community. That would be a great fit for my business or my organization and be able to reach out. And so that's really our hope in addition to bringing together people in person or virtually, you know, to talk about some of the ways that that we can continue to push forward. Very good. No, we'll, we'll continue. We'll, we'll stay in touch for sure as well. So we appreciate that. Oh, I'm excited. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Very good. Well, that's it for uh, this episode of The Buzz House. A big thanks to Jenna Louie for joining the show today to talk about what Ivory Innovations is doing to help advance innovative housing affordability solutions. So thanks again, Jenna. Once again, I'm Don Bernards. And I'm Garrett Gibson. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out BakerTilly.com. If you have a suggestion for the show, email us at buildabakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at BakerTilly.com. See you next time on Buzz House. Buzz House.